In this message, I want to talk about how God speaks to you and to me, how he speaks to us. And he does that in one of three ways. One, through God's word. Two, through the wise counsel of godly people. And three, through the inner promptings and leadings of the Holy Spirit. Now, in this message, I want to talk about the first way that God speaks to us, and that is through his word. And to do that, I want us to look at a passage from Ezekiel. So before we turn to the actual passage in Ezekiel, let's take a look for a moment at the backstory of Ezekiel. It's 593 BCE. Ezekiel is 30 years old. He has prepared all of his life to be a priest. That means a position of status and wealth and standing within his nation of Israel. But he was taken off into captivity just as he was about to become a priest. He finds himself by the banks of the river Kivar in bondage in despair. He has lost everything, his wealth, his status, his hope, his future, his dreams. He is alone in captivity. And not only that, but God is dead. The God of the Babylonians who took him into captivity defeated his God and destroyed the temple. He's in Babylon now. These are the big gods. My God was a little God. So he wonders, what happened to me? What happened to my life? Where did it go? Why did this happen to me? And then, all of a sudden, in the midst of those kinds of feelings, God shows up. So, as Ezekiel sits there by the banks of the river Kivar, helpless, hopeless, alone, he has lost everything. All of a sudden, he tells us, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. That God was not dead, that he had come to him in exile, in Babylon. He had come in promise and purpose and in power. And God was going to speak to him, but before he did, he is going to give him a scroll to look at. Ezekiel writes in chapter 2, verse 9, When I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. He sees a hand stretched out to him. Now, remember, in the Bible, when we see this phrase, the hand of the Lord, it represents that God is active, he is alive, he is about to do something. It's the hand that is the active agent of God. I have a friend in Africa who's a missionary to uh, the lepers, and when their hands fall off through this terrible disease, she said her, her job in the morning is to duct tape spoons and forks to their arms so that they can eat. Arms are sort of useless without a hand. And so God extends his hand, his active hand, to Ezekiel. And in it is a scroll, a papyrus scroll. The ancient Egyptians used these scrolls 5,000 years ago. They would take the leaves of the papyrus reed and they would cut them up into squares and they would sew them together so that this scroll would be 12 to 15 inches high and 20 to 30 feet long. And it would be secured around sticks at the end so that you could roll the scroll up or unroll the scroll to wherever you wanted to read. It was a nifty way to find a chapter. And so we have this scroll. It's 20 to 30 feet long. It's given to Ezekiel. And notice, it has writing on the front and the back. Now, this is unusual. Normally, writing is only on the front. It's hard to write on a scroll. It's costly. And so the front was filled with words and the back was empty. But here we find there's writing on the front and the back. Why? because God doesn't want any space for any of Ezekiel's interpretations. God is going to tell him everything. And everything he tells Ezekiel, he wants Ezekiel to tell the people. So he's giving him an external truth source from an infinite vantage point, an eternal perspective on where Ezekiel finds himself. Now this is important. He's going to give him this scroll with God's word, God's truth in it. And it's not just our limited feelings or our limited thoughts from a, a limited lifetime 
of the billions of people that have ever lived. We don't have that great of perspective. God's going to give his perspective. It's not a 30,000 foot perspective or a 50,000 foot. It is an eternal perspective on life. And he's going to hand it to Ezekiel. Isn't it interesting that God has not left us alone? Not only does he exist, but he has revealed himself. This is the great distinction of Christianity over all other world religions, that God speaks. So he's going to give him a scroll. He's going to give him something with verbal communication on it. So let's see how God speaks to your life and my life today. He gives Ezekiel a scroll which represents God's word. So we pick up in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1, with these words. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. If you'll recall, God calls Ezekiel the son of man, Ben Adam, Ben son Adam Adam, the son of Adam. That means that he represents you and me. He represents the whole human race. And God is going to speak to him as the representative of the human race. And Ezekiel is going to act out these prophecies of God as a representative of the human race, of you and for me. So the first thing God says to him in terms of how he speaks to us is this. He says exactly that. Don't, don't pass over this passage. He says, he said to me. He said to me. This is a big deal. God is speaking. Question, have you heard God speak to you today? Have you? Our God is a God of relationship. God loves relationships. That's why we exist. Have you ever wondered, why did God create me? He created me because he wants to have a relationship with me, and he wants me to have a relationship with him. Our God is a God of relationship. He loves relationships. And he wants to have a relationship with you and me, and that's why that relationship is the starting point of all of life. Everything starts here with our relationship with God. Now, for there to be a relationship, there needs to be communication. Communication requires someone who is speaking and someone who is listening or responding. And that communication is generally verbal by nature. There's other ways to communicate, but generally we communicate verbally to each other. I had a conversation with my wife, Susan, this past week, and she was sharing a lot that was very heavy on her mind, but it was Sunday, and uh, at one o'clock, the Pittsburgh Steelers were playing, so I had the game on my mind, and I was listening to everything that she said, but for some reason, my mind just drifted off to that Steeler game, and, and as she was sharing, I, I just said, hey, I, I wonder what the quarterback situation is going to be like for the Steelers today. Well, that sort of ended the communication for a while because she felt I was not listening to what she had to say or responding. My mind was somewhere else. Relationship requires communication in which there is someone who is speaking and there is someone who is listening and responding. So God's a God of relationship and he loves to communicate to us and the primary way he does that is through his word. Well, let's talk about how does God communicate through his word? Remember, we started this verse, he said to me. And how does that process take place where something is said to someone and it gets written down and then it becomes Holy Scripture? So let's talk about how the Bible was written. Well, the first idea is that it was written through the concept of a mechanical dictation, a verbal dictation that human beings are reduced to machines. There's no room for anyone's personality. God is completely in control of the process. He controls the hand that writes the words. It is mechanical, it is verbal, it is dictation. You could think of a courtroom stenographer who records the exact words that are being said in the courtroom. Well, there's another way to think about things, and I think this is the more biblical way. And this comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. All. What's the definition of all? All means all. Everything. Each and every word. It is plenary. All. 
scripture. What's the word for scripture that's being used here in the Greek? Graphe, meaning writing. All writing is theonoustos. Theo, God, noustos, breathed, breathed out. All graphe is given by God through divine inspiration. Think about it. To speak, we have to exhale. When I speak, I breathe out. And, and that's the concept that Paul wants us to understand here, that God is breathing out. He breathes out his word, and then we inhale it. We receive it. We breathe it in. God breathes it out, and we breathe it in. All God is given by expiration, and we receive it by inhalation, by breathing in. So what happens is that God uses the own unique personality and background of the writers to produce the words that he wants to be written. He carefully prepares them to breathe into them his word. They're each different. Every single one of them are different. Paul is different from Ezekiel. Ezekiel is different from Amos, the shepherd of Tekoa, who was different from Moses. They're all different. God uses their own unique personalities and backgrounds. Think of Paul. He, he was a Hellenist, a Greek. He was a Roman citizen. He was a Hebrew scholar. And God took all of that to write his words through the personality and the background of Paul because God was carefully preparing his personality and his background to be used to breathe into him his words so that, that he could breathe them out to us. That's why the Bible is so much more than a book. What is this right here? It's a football. A football represents so much more than a football. It represents Saturday and Sundays where people orient their entire lives around this football. There are contributions made to the universities. There are coaches, there's teams, there's salaries in the professional league. Uh, student bodies turn out. They put on different clothing to represent their teams. There are TV contracts. There are tailgate parties. A football represents so much more than a football. Everything revolves around the football, a simple football. And it's the same with the Bible. The Bible is so much more than a book. It represents everything that we need to know about who we are and where we came from and how we should live in this life. So God comes to Ezekiel and Ezekiel writes, he said to me, he said to me, he said to me, God reveals himself. He speaks verbally to me. I can understand him. He said to me. Now watch what happens in chapter 3, verse 2. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll and he said to me, Son of man, fill your belly with this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. It was in my mouth sweet as honey. God comes to him and he says, Eat this scroll and I ate it. Now remember, this scroll is 20 to 30 feet long. By this time, people have gathered around Ezekiel. He's got quite a following around him now because of all these visions and of all the noise and the thunder and the lightning and the events that have already happened in his life. So they're watching him. He's like, like the Fox News or the CNN of the day. Everybody wants to find out what the news is. So Ezekiel says, go get a scroll. And they bring it to him and he begins to unroll it and eat it one piece at a time. 20 to 30 feet. He literally eats the scroll. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel acts out the word of God through all these different messages and symbols and ways of doing things that people can understand. It's like, it's like watching the movies. You know, Let's go see what Ezekiel is doing now. So he's, he's eating this scroll and dipping it in water and trying to digest it. It's 20 to 30 feet long. No one has any idea how long it took him to do that. But we do know this, that to eat the scroll, he had to do something active. He had to open his mouth, he had to chew, he had to eat, and he had to swallow. And that's a part of God speaking to us, is that we have to get actively involved and engaged. And to get actively involved and engaged in God speaking to me through his word, I find that I need quiet. 
There's a lot of noise in this world. It, it, it's hard to hear God when we have a whole lot of noise going on. They're building a house next door to our house. And, and the last couple of days have been filled with these machines with the beep, beep, beeps when they back up. It has been so distracting to me. It's hard to listen to God with all kinds of distractions in our lives. It's hard to listen to God when we're moving fast. So God says, you're going to need to rest. If I'm going to speak to you through my word, you're going to need some peace. You're going to need to carve out some time where you can hear my voice. So he said to me, eat this scroll. And then he said, fill your stomach with it, inwardly digest it. Eat everything until you are full. Fully absorb my word. I'm not a Jeopardy fan, but I've been watching Jeopardy the last week or so because a fellow on there is setting a record. It's his 35th night. He's won over $1.4 million answering questions. And so the polls just keep getting higher and higher of the viewership of uh, Jeopardy. And so I was asking Susan, how do you think he knows the answer to all these questions? Because not only does he answer them, but he, he clearly defeats every contestant so far out ahead of them. And, and she said, well, I, I think that over the course of his lifetime, he has absorbed everything that he has seen and heard. It's all in there, and you can see it coming out. Well, this is what God wants to happen with his word. He wants us to simply absorb it. God wants us, when we absorb his word, to fill our inner core with food from him. The Bible, God's word, is food from God for our inner core. You see, God created us with an inner core in our lives, a, a, an inner being, a, a spirit. We're spiritual beings. And that inner core was designed to be only filled by him. And, and when that gets filled by him, it affects everything that we do, our relationships, our friendships, our work, our families, our food, where we live, how we spend our money. Everything happens and emanates out of the inner core, our inner spirit of our lives. And if we fill that inner core with the wrong kinds of things, then bad things come out. But if we fill it with good things, then good things come out. Purposeful things, meaningful things, fulfilling things. God's word is God's food for our souls. We are what we eat. If we eat healthy things, our lives tend to be healthy. If we eat unhealthy things, our lives tend to be unhealthy. It's the same with the Spirit. It's why we ask the question, who or what is shaping and filling my inner core this very moment? God says, fill your spirit, fill your core with my thoughts, with my words, with my ideas. Now, how do we fill ourselves with God's word? Well, first, let me give you a word of what I don't think works. Uh, it's not a time to read the Bible through in a year or do a deep exegetical study of Revelation or uh, master the Bible, one of the epistles or a difficult book of the Bible. That's not how God is going to speak to us. Those things are all important. They're critical. When I was in seminary, my professor said to me, there's four ways you can read a book. You can skim it, you can read it, you can learn it, and you can master it. And there are certainly times when God wants us to study his word so that we master it. But that's not how we're going to connect with God every single day. That's not how we're going to build our relationship with God. There is that time to learn about God. But here, in connecting with God and hearing from God every single day, we want to build on our relationship. We want to have that relationship with him and connect with him in that personal relationship. And my experience is that to do that, we're simply going to get before God in a quiet way and read one of the passages of Scripture that speak to us, the Psalms, the Proverbs, the Gospels, something that we're not learning about God, but God is speaking to us about ourselves in a way that is uniquely designed for you and for me. It's a way in which we want to let God speak spirit to spirit, from his spirit to my spirit and my spirit back to his. Let God feed our spirits, spirit to spirit, God's spirit to my spirit, my spirit 
to God's Spirit through the Psalms or the Proverbs or the Gospels. So we need to find a quiet place where we can eat God's Word and fill our stomachs in a relational, spirit-to-spirit -spirit way. And notice what Ezekiel says happened when he ate God's Word, his scroll, and he filled his stomach with it. He said it tasted sweet as honey. Hey, I want you to imagine something for, for just a minute. I want you to imagine your favorite sweet food. What is it? I know the number one Krispy Kreme seller are the original glazed donuts. I love those glazed donuts. I remember one time when I sat down with a glass of milk and I ate all 12, a dozen Krispy Kreme glazed donuts. What is it for you? A Snicker bar or a layered caramel? cake with vanilla ice cream. What is your favorite sweet food? What makes your mouth drool? When I was a kid, I used to eat sleeves of Oreos and fill my stomach with them. I would eat until I couldn't eat anymore. Fill your stomach. So my stomach felt like there was a bowling ball in the middle of it. It's so good that you just want more. And this is what God has in mind when we read his word. He wants it to be sweet as honey for us. Have you ever been in God's presence, reading a sweet book from God, personally to you, and you've known that sweetness and you haven't wanted to stop, you just want to keep tasting it? You don't want to leave, you want to stay there forever. David was called the sweet psalmist of Israel. His psalms are sweet to that inner core and spirit inside of us. Because of what I do as a pastor, I've been to a lot of rooms where people are spending their last days here on planet Earth, they're dying. And oftentimes they'll ask me to read to them, but they have something very specific in mind. They're not asking, will you read me the latest beach novel or the sports page? No, they say, will you read the Psalms to me? The Psalms, they're sweet, spirited. They speak to my spirit, to my inner core, spirit to spirit. They are peaceful and they are fulfilling. And I can tell you, when you read the Psalms to a dying person in their last hours on planet Earth, it brings a peace to them that is beyond human understanding. There's an anointing that takes place through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the single most important thing we can do every day is to hear from God, is to listen to what God is trying to say to you and me. God what are you trying to say to me through this passage of Scripture this day? Inwardly, in my inner core, I will digest that. I will eat it. I will fill my stomach with it. And when I do, it will taste sweet as honey. He said to me, eat this scroll. Fill your stomach. It will taste as sweet as honey to you. Now, in the next message, I want to talk about the second way that God speaks to us through the wise counsel of godly people.